When I arrived for my interview, um, it, it was clear the school was in some difficulty. Just walking down the corridors when classes were changing over was a, a feat. I mean, it was a difficult thing to do. It was absolutely appalling. I mean, it was very, very difficult to manage. The Ofsted report from March 2004 quite clearly said that behaviour was poor. Um, in fact, it was, it was dangerously poor, in my view. In March 2004, Hurlingham and Chelsea, a comprehensive school in West London, was placed in special measures by Ofsted. If you read the Ofsted report from 2004 when it went into special measures, it pretty much says everything about the school was failing. So it was behaviour and attitudes, it was attendance and punctuality, teaching and learning, um, standards and, and achievement, governance and many issues about leadership and management. Penny Johnson was a member of the senior leadership team at the time. There was a lot of internal truancy. Um, children were late to lessons or uh, you know, often didn't reach lessons at all. I think the quality of relationships between students and staff was very poor. Um, there was a lot of confrontation. I think relationships between staff and staff were often quite poor as well. I think staff had lost sight of the reason why they were here. Penny was aware of problems with the governing body, which was also deemed to be failing by Ofsted. There wasn't a clear focus in terms of where the school was going, so it was difficult for the governors to support the school. Caroline Ground and Hugh McMillan are both long-standing governors at Hurlingham and Chelsea School. We had a, quite a big governing body in those days. It was bigger than it is now. I think it was about 25. I personally felt I was fairly helpless, actually. What one noticed were the discipline problems. I mean, I was sitting on discipline panels two or three times a week. It, you know, it was sort of my life. And the other problem uh, was that we had all those subcommittees, which uh, and there was uh, there was very little in the governing body um, instructions which said what the subcommittees were supposed to do. Several months before the damning Ofsted inspection, the governors were called to an emergency meeting. We were just faced with a fait accompli, completely, on the day of the meeting. We heard, effectively, that the head had been fired by the council. A few months after that came the Ofsted inspection, which placed the school in special measures. For me personally, and I think for a number of colleagues, there was a sense of relief that actually something now could be done. The governors had to act quickly and their first move was to appoint a new head teacher. I chaired the committee that, that looked at the candidates and we were very fortunate. We had six good candidates and I think we had two um, really outstanding ones of whom Phil was one. Phil Cross accepted the post but knew it would be a huge challenge to turn the school around. With the full backing of the governing body, Phil decided to focus on three key objectives. Teaching and learning, pupil behaviour and governor effectiveness. What we did right from the beginning was to put teaching and learning right at the very centre of what the improvement strategy was going to be. And one of the things that concerned me almost immediately is when I was trying to get to grips with kind of what was going on in the school, I was initially told that the school had something like 25 vacancies. However, what was interesting is when I started to work with one of the deputies in the school around the timetable, staffing, what we were, how we were going to organise the curriculum in September of that year, um, it became very clear that when we costed the curriculum very accurately, in fact, the school had been overstaffed and therefore we didn't have 25 vacancies. We probably had 12 Phil decided to recruit a number of his new staff straight from university via the Teach First scheme. It did give me an opportunity as a new head to establish a new culture around those people because they were new, they didn't know what the school was like before um, and I was very careful to ensure that we got the vision that we had for the school over to those people straight away. The first thing he said to the staff was that he did not want any staff member to shout at children. And that had been f for significant percentages of the staff, the, the behaviour management style. 
and he reassured the staff that if they stopped shouting, stress levels, both theirs and the children's, would come down. And having, sitting in the audience listening to that, I thought, yes, that's the kind of thing we need to be hearing. We insisted almost immediately that all lessons were planned. So we have a common lesson planning pro forma. All, all teachers were expected to plan every lesson in detail. And we immediately made moves to make sure the curriculum was compliant with the national curriculum, and which it wasn't at the time the school went into special measures. To achieve this, Phil set up a new system linking the senior leadership team to curriculum areas. That meant that everyone on the leadership team was not only fulfilling their own responsibilities, whole school, but everybody on that team had an eye on, real focus on teaching and learning and what was going on in different curriculum areas. And Phil isn't satisfied with just supporting other members of staff. He also insists that he still gets into the classroom himself. We're just going to do a quick recap of how you find the area of a circle. I took the decision when I became a head teacher, which is now nine years ago, that I was going to continue to teach maths, which is my subject, partly because I enjoy teaching. Secondly, it, it enables you to engage with students in a different way than you would just being a head teacher. And thirdly, I think it does help you to understand the context of what other staff are working with. Plus also, I wouldn't expect staff to do what I wouldn't do myself. And Phil's introduced several changes designed to improve working conditions for staff. All staff are entitled to free breakfast in the morning. All staff who eat with the children at lunchtime get a free lunch. We offer free tea and coffee all day. We've tried to minimise the amount of evening activity in the school because, you know, if you're still at working at school at 10 o'clock at night, you can't possibly be properly prepared to teach at 8.30 the next morning. It was also important to address the needs of another stakeholder group, parents. Right from the very first term, we remodelled our parents' evenings. So we, we, ha we now have a parental review day where we collapse the school timetable for a day and every parent and student gets a half an hour interview with a member of staff. So what we encourage staff to do is if, there's, if they have a problem with the child, um, we encourage them to have like a two or three minute conversation only with a parent at the end of the school day just to keep the parent informed that there's an issue. Similarly, we put a lot of store by just phoning parents if their child's doing very well because that actually we found that parents actually quite like that balance between what's going well and what's, what's not, not going well. When Phil uh, joined the school, he sort of made a clean sweep, like teachers, um, discipline, that let the pupils know what they're in the school for. If a child is not in, you get a call. Exactly. If a child yeah. is doing good, you get a call. If they're doing bad, you get a call. And, it, and that is what you need. You, there's no good coming to a meeting three months, four months down the line and being told that your child is not doing this, not doing this, not doing this, and then you've got a great big mound of stuff. Next on Phil's list was pupil behaviour. We immediately had a policy, no swearing, nobody was expected to shout or raise their voice, including teachers, that people should conduct themselves appropriately, nobody should be on a mobile phone, nobody should be throwing things. They all seem fairly obvious, but simply having a list of 10 or 12 very simple minimum expectations. Many of our children come from backgrounds where they don't see bringing a pen to school as a, as a high priority. For the last four years, we've, we've just provided all the equipment, pens, pencils, rulers, calculators. What I saw Phil actually doing, which was surprised me, was focusing on uniform. That was one of his top buttons the first term, and it did made a big difference. We have invested more and more of our time in making sure that the uniform is strictly adhered to. We, we do have staff on duty at the gate in the morning, and on the rare occasion students don't arrive with all the correct uniform, we do send them home. We do put a high profile on attendance and punctuality because there is a direct correlation between attendance and student attainment. Then came changes to governance. We reduced the size of the governing body from 22 down to 14. We got rid of all the committees and we've never reintroduced them. 
Phil then took the decision to create a spin-off from the governing body to form the School Improvement Partnership Board. That board had myself as the head teacher, um, the chair of governors, another governor, a senior local authority representative, somebody from London Challenge and another person from the Department for Education. And what that effectively did was gave me some executive powers. In other words, although the governing body was still responsible for the school, a lot of the, the, the real nitty-gritty conversation about things that were urgent happened in that School Improvement Partnership Board. I still was obviously presenting everything again to the full governing body. Um, it just meant that I could work much more quickly with that smaller group of people. Victor Burgess was the representative on the Executive Committee from London Challenge. This is an organisation, now at national level, composed of educational experts. So former heads, former directors of education, uh, the odd professor, a little group of us really, a kind of think tank, but a think tank which was very hands-on as well. And our job was to work with those schools in London who were in inverted commas failing. And Hurlingham and Chelsea was one of our very first schools. The early stage in the kind of intervention work that I do is often the most important. And often that's about getting people to work together, uh, it's about forming teams, it's about getting people to look at the evidence, not to recriminate about the fact that they're in special measures, not, not to blame. And that can be very difficult at times, and it's almost like working sometimes with a dysfunctional family. Two years into the turnaround, Sue Malcolm joined the governing body and went on to become chair. You could see there was a clear direction set and clear um, aims and how to do it, but it was still getting everybody on board. So what is the situation now at Hurlingham and Chelsea? Over the three years up to last year, we were the most improved school in London and the second most improved school in the country. The school's 5A star to C pass rate has risen from 20% in 2004 to currently 81% in 2008. And at the same time, the Ofsted judgments in the school have gone from obviously failing in and, and being in special measures in 2004. In January 2008, the school was judged by Ofsted to be good with outstanding features. And we should be singing that, really. But we're not used to it, so maybe that's part of the problem. And what advice would Phil and his team give to other schools in a similar situation? The biggest thing that matters is the head, the leadership. That's, uh, I've, I've experienced that as a parent and now as a governor. The very best thing is to keep it simple. It isn't rocket science. You need to focus on three or four key areas and then you have to be rigorous in pursuing those areas. It, it's true to say for this school that um, we do serve a population of children that all come with a story and often that's depicted as children who come with various levels of disadvantage, um, whether that be poverty or other problems that families experience. We do genuinely believe that we can break that link between social circumstance and attainment. And indeed, the evidence shows we, we have done that. Mm -hmm.